Welcome to this conversation, Rethinking Prosecution, brought to you by the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series, which is a joint venture of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Hawaii Community Foundation, and Kamehameha Schools. Today's program is brought to you by the King Kamehameha the Fifth Judiciary History Center and the William S. Richardson School of Law, where I serve as Dean. I'm Camille Nelson, and I will be moderating today's conversation. Criminal prosecutors in the American legal system have sweeping responsibilities and they wield awesome powers with great discretion. They make decisions about how and when the law is enforced. They also decide whether or not to charge and at what level to charge and what sentences to seek in plea bargaining or at trial. Prosecutors also preside over a range of initiatives to enhance public safety and address intractable social ills, from domestic violence, to houselessness, to drug addiction, to corporate malfeasance and government corruption. District attorneys who are generally elected get pulled in many directions. When fear of crime spikes, DAs are pressed to crack down and imprison people in greater numbers. On the other hand, when we are reminded of the costs and consequences of mass incarcerations, DAs are pressed to reduce jail populations and implement more thoughtful drug policies, for instance. So too, activists demand accountability for police officers involved in violence and misconduct. But often when DAs bring such indictments, as both of our guests today have, backlashes, backlash often ensues. Serving as a prosecutor is therefore no easy job. Their offices are vital public institutions that have a great deal of impact in protecting the public, structuring social stratification, and determining the boundaries of rights and freedoms. However, these structures and systems are not easily transformed. We have with us today three leaders who have made reforming the front end of the criminal justice system their life's work. San Francisco's District Attorney, Chesa Boudin, Honolulu's Prosecuting Attorney, Steve Ahm, and Federal Public Defender, Minda Yamaga. Before we start, I'd like to just explain some of the webinar logistics. Uh, let me say a word about format and participation. If you're joining us on Zoom, we invite you to submit questions and comments using the Q&A tool. We will also be posting some of the questions you submitted upon registration. If you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, we invite you to like the page and also to submit your questions and comments there. Fielding your inquiries and relaying some of your questions to us is my colleague at the law school, Professor Justin Levinson. Thank you, Justin. Now to our first guest, Chesa Boudin. The first guest with whom I'll be speaking for about a half an hour has tangled with the criminal justice system and bureaucracies therein since he was a toddler. Both of his parents who were revolutionaries affiliated with the Weather Underground went to prison for homicide when he was a baby. Chesa spent his youth going in and out of prisons to visit them, but he made his way to Yale and became a Rhodes Scholar, a book author, and eventually a public defender in San Francisco. About a year ago, he defied the odds to become one of the most reform-minded prosecutors in the country. Aloha and welcome, Chesa. I want to start with a bit of a personal question, if I may. Um, you may, and thanks for having me. It's great to be with you all. Aloha. It's great to see you. It's an honor. Um, you've had a momentous autumn, Chesa, including uh, challenges and, and beauty. You're facing a concerted recall effort. Uh, your father, though, received clemency and got paroled after 40 years in prison. And not least, you have a new baby. Congratulations. Um, how was that journey? How has it felt with all of this happening in the midst of the pandemic, no less? Well, Camille, as you said, it's uh, it's been an exciting uh, couple of months for me and my family. It, it, we are literally growing in both directions. My father has had a rebirth of sorts after more than 40 years in a cage. He has joined our family again. And at exactly the same uh, time, just, just months apart, uh, my wife and I had our first child, a, a baby boy who's healthy and thriving. 
Um, it's, it's a momentous occasion. We are exuberant even as we're exhausted. We're uh, fascinated by the opportunities even as we're fatigued and we're inspired even as we're somewhat intimidated at the challenges uh, in front of us. And so it's a great time for us to celebrate family and love and to appreciate freedom and the simple pleasures of every single uh, little thing. The, the first smile from my son, uh, my father's first opportunity to sit down in a restaurant mm -hmm. and use a metal knife and fork to eat a meal in 40 years. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really, that's a lot. That's a lot. And you have such a wonderful um, energy about that. I say embrace the exhaustion and take heart from those smiles. They'll, those smiles, uh, you know, will light up your, your journey. Um, along the way, you've had options and you could have run far away from the type of work you're doing, right? Given the, the, all that you and your family have been through, you know, what pulled you in this direction? It, it could have gone in a completely other direction. Absolutely, Camille. I, I think in many ways, this is a, a long and a complicated conversation. Um, and I want to be respectful of the other panelists and also of the time that we should appropriately dedicate to dialogue and to question and answer. Um, so let me, at a high level, give you a few answers, all of which we could unravel and unwind and, and, and just dive into in much more uh, depth. One is the supporting and loving environment that I was raised in. The fact that I was not taught by my adoptive parents or by the people around me to be ashamed of my experience, but rather to embrace it and to own it. Um, that was a huge privilege in many ways compared to most people impacted by incarceration. And, and second and, and related, I think, was um, many of the other privileges, white, male, heterosexual, uh, raised in an upper middle class, adoptive family, so many things uh, being a U.S. citizen that set me apart from the majority of people impacted by incarceration. And, and those things, those privileges gave me opportunities to turn um, the, the, the real trauma that I suffered as a child, the real damage that my parents' crime caused, not only to the men who were killed and, and to the communities where the crime occurred, but also to me as a third party victim, if you will, into opportunity, into voice, uh, into uh, something that I could harness for change. Um, and then I want to just give a shout out to Professor Robert Parkinson, uh, who you all know and love as I do, because he was a professor of mine my freshman year at Yale. And one of my very first classes, in fact, was with him. And we were studying punishment in American history. And it was through that class and through mentors uh, like him along the way that I was able to find a voice and, and channel my own lived experience, not into, as I said, not into stigma, not into something that I rejected and tried to hide in the corner, but rather into a identity that I embraced as a tool for social change and improvements in public policy. Yeah, I appreciate your answer very much. You know, frankly, I love the way that you are acknowledging history and the way it lives in the present moment and can inform the way we go forward but also the self-awareness that you're bringing to the work you do. You campaigned on the promise to use the powers of the uh, district attorney's office to help roll back mass incarceration. And among your first moves was to eliminate cash bail. So, so why was that a priority? Well, Camille, I believe that we build safer and more just communities through policies that promote equity and transparency and fairness. And money bail is a quintessential example of a policy and practice unique to this country that undermines public safety and equal protection under law. Um, here's how it works for folks who aren't familiar at a high level. Someone gets arrested and they can immediately buy their way out of jail even before a prosecutor has made a charging decision if they have enough money to do so. Meanwhile, another person, a person who may be arrested and accused of a far less serious crime or may have far weaker evidence against them and stronger ties to the community and family and employment will languish behind bars simply because of their poverty. In other words, it's a system that allows wealthy, dangerous people to buy their freedom at a tremendous cost to public safety and simultaneously forces those who are living in poverty to risk losing their job, custody of their children, their cars, their housing, health care, all because they're being incarcerated due to their poverty. In other words, it undermines public safety and undermines 
equal protection under law. In San Francisco, under my watch, my prosecutors are only allowed to ask for someone to be detained in custody pending trial if there is no less restrictive alternative that can assure public safety. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. We don't have a system on my watch where custody status, pretrial incarceration is determined based on wealth. It's determined instead based on risk. That's how we build safety. That's how we give meaning to the promise of equal protection under law. And, and how does that risk assessment and, and factoring in public safety on the one hand and mass incarceration and the, and the drivers there too on the other, you know, you've looked at cases that left the DA's office years ago, and I know you set up a task force to look at excessive sentencing imposed by some of your predecessors. You know, what have you found and how does that relate to the ethos you've just been sharing? Well, one of the things that we know is that as, um, you know, the years have passed, we've moved, and you, and you talked about this, Camille, in your introduction, over the last several decades, we've moved from a historic moment where the only thing people wanted to talk about was how we could send more people to prison for longer, to a recognition that mass incarceration not only makes us less safe, creates a cycle of intergenerational incarceration of crime and victimization, but it's also bankrupting local governments and starving them of the resources they need to invest in things that truly build safe and vibrant communities, things like mental health care and housing and job training and education. And so we've seen a shift towards more data-driven responses to crime, towards more humane responses to the needs that victims have. And I believe that the, the, the policies we're implementing, including money bail and including resentencing folks who were sentenced 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago in a very different era, um, is simply applying today's standards based in data and empirical evidence to what was done in years past based on fear and fear mongering. In other words, my office has led the way in California in resentencing people who have been in prison for so long that they no longer pose any threat to public safety and where we know that they have been adequately punished for the crimes that they committed. We found, just to give you one example, a woman who's been in prison for about four decades, who's in her 80s, who's suffering from serious illness and who has a reentry plan that assured us she was safe to be released. There is no reason consistent with justice, consistent with public safety that that woman needed to die behind bars. And so we asked the court to resentence her and spend her few remaining years with her family. And, and we've done that in about 50 plus cases since I took office. How much of this is a, is a culture shift a, and versus a, a sort of strategic and, and structural system, systemic shift. And I ask that because, you know, there's that saying, and I, I think it's Peter Drucker, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So, you know, what, how are you trying to like touch on all those pivot points and push points to, to, to do what you're setting out to do? That's right. Yeah, I think culture eats policy for breakfast. I think that's right. And it's, it's something that we see both within my office, within individual district attorney's offices, police departments. Look, you need good laws, you need good policies on the books, and you also need a culture that's open to those laws and policies that actually implements them. And so inevitably, there's gonna be resistance. Let me give you a, a clear example, and we're seeing this uh, as clearly as anywhere in Los Angeles County today, where uh, my predecessor in the San Francisco district attorney's office was elected in LA, on a mandate for really significant substantive change, resentencing, um, reducing mass incarceration. And the lawyers in his office are suing him to prevent him from implementing policies that he promised voters he would implement. That is an example of very deeply entrenched cultural change. And, and one of the reasons, I wanna just sort of zoom out 30,000 feet. If I come into office, right, I was elected on a clear mandate for change for changing the culture, for changing the policies and the practices. Many of the people in my office have been here 10, 20 years. And if I come in and I say to them, hey, you've been doing this longer than me, but you're racist. And what you've been doing is not promoting public safety, it's undermining public safety. And by the way, what you're doing isn't promoting justice, it's undermining justice. I'm inevitably gonna face a lot of resistance. People don't wanna hear that. These are folks who for the most part have dedicated their careers to public service because they believe in what they do. And you can change the culture far more effectively by meeting people where they're at, by showing them evidence, and by incrementally, if 
intentionally and with purpose moving the needle about what the norms are than by trying to steamroll folks who've been doing the job for their entire careers. Now, it's a process and every jurisdiction is gonna be different. Every individual lawyer, victim advocate, police officer is gonna respond differently. But I think we need to be realistic as a movement focused on criminal justice reform, as individuals in elected office, we need to be realistic about the fact that it is not a, a bureaucracy where one person makes the decisions and does every single thing along the way, right? There are thousands of lawyers and social workers and sentencing planners and probation officers and police officers and judges and bailiffs that are out there shaping the outcomes of each case passing through the criminal legal system in this country. And electing reform-minded prosecutors is a critical step. And it's not alone going to be enough. We also need to win hearts and minds. We also need to show through empirical evidence and through intentional storytelling that these are policies that build safety and promote justice. And, and within, that, within that ecosystem that you're, that you're talking about, um, some have accused you of being soft on crime, but we also know that there's been perhaps a recalibration of emphasis. I wanna hear your words on that. As you've also tried to take a harder line on, against, for example, hate crimes, human trafficking, and labor law violators. And so what do you think the DA's office can accomplish in, in sort of you know, this, this space as you're juggling so many push-pull factors and trying to you know, shift minds and change systems and, and to do better? Well, first of all, let's be clear about what metrics should matter and, and what the shortcomings are of the really narrow myopic way in which far too many folks in, in public discourse try to measure the effectiveness of, of prosecutors. We should not be measuring our success by charging rates or conviction rates or by length of sentences. We need to move away from a model of justice where victims are told that all they can expect, all they can hope for is a punitive sentence. We need to do far more for survivors of crime. We need to do far more for public safety than simply hang people in the public square until they're dead. That is a history that we should be ashamed of. It is not rooted in data. It is not rooted in empirical evidence. And it does far too little for victims who have real needs that go unmet when our criminal legal system treats them as nothing more than a piece of evidence. And so what I wanna focus on is, are we reducing recidivism? Are we promoting victim satisfaction and healing? Are we breaking cycles of violence? Are we using interventions that are humane, cost-effective and efficient at promoting healing and public safety? Things like drug treatment, things like mental health care, things like housing for those survivors of domestic violence that have nowhere to go, but all too often are pulled into court, treated as a piece of evidence, and then ignored when they have unmet needs. We as a system must do better in framing the conversation around metrics that actually correlate with the things our voters and constituents and communities need to be and feel safe. And when, when victims of crimes engage in this conversation, after the, often there's a call for greater punishment and retribution though, right? So, and I know you've done a lot of work to work with victims. So how, given what you just said, do you try to, to take all of that into account? There are real, genuine and sincerely felt calls for retribution and punishment, but diversion programs and, and looking at the whole person and seeing how mental health comes into this. Well, look, there's a couple of things to remember. One is, historically, victims have had no choice but to measure justice in years of incarceration and pounds of flesh. The system has not presented them with any other alternative. And so it, tough on crime prosecutors and police unions have intentionally fostered a culture where victims feel that they didn't get justice if they don't obtain the death penalty or if they don't obtain a life without parole sentence. And so that was an intentional decision by the leaders of a failed approach to criminal justice. We need to be just as intentional in thinking more broadly, more holistically, more restoratively about what options we present victims with. And I know from my office's own work that when we say to victims, we can go the traditional prosecution route, or if you prefer, we can go a restorative justice route. We've seen in a multi-year study we did with our juvenile division 
that overwhelmingly victims of juvenile delinquency choose restorative justice. And when they do, they are more satisfied with the outcome of the process than the alternative traditional approach. And critically, from a public safety lens, we see far lower recidivism rates amongst the young people that are allowed to go through that restorative justice process than when we do the traditional lock them up and throw away the key approach. In other words, what I'm saying is, yes, many victims have been held out by tough on crime prosecutors and police union bosses as folks who demand punitive justice. And that is in a context where victims who ask for anything else are ignored, silenced, and sidelined, and where far too, vic vic far too few victims are even given a choice. When I ran for office in 2019, one of my commitments was that we would eventually give every crime victim the right to choose the path their case took through the criminal legal system. If they wanted restorative justice as an approach, that should be available to them. And we have a long way to go before we make that a reality, but I'm proud to say we are making progress. We are significantly expanding that as a victim's rights issue, as an approach that we can give victims the choice to pursue or not as they prefer. And that is a critical part of changing the culture, of empowering and centering crime victims, and of making sure we are thinking about safety in ways that are grounded in data, empirical evidence, and a long-term, not a short-term myopic view based in fear, but in fact, based in justice. Sure, and one of the, one of the things that we've seen a fair bit of, uh, you know, take, uh, frankly, increase over the last couple of years is hate crimes, right? So I think the data indicates that this is a real scourge and we have to be uh, ever intentional about it. And San Francisco has been front and center in some ways in this conversation, especially with respect to hate crimes against Asian Americans. What do you think prosecutors offices should be doing to combat this issue? We need to do far more than we've done. Um, let's be clear, when someone is attacked because of the color of their skin, because of their immigration status, because of the language they speak, that is not just an attack on one person or one community, that is an attack on all of us. I'm proud of the work my office has done over the last year, both in the community, trainings for nonprofit partners to help educate about what a hate crime is and how to respond if you witness or, victim or are a victim of one, of our partnership with local law enforcement here in San Francisco and around the Bay Area to ensure we are sharing resources, training materials, and best practices to identify and hold accountable those that commit hate crimes, and also our partnerships with members of the community to do education and prevention work, to help build, uh, build bridges and heal divides that have been at the root of so many hate instances, hate acts, hate speech, and hate crimes. We know that under the US Constitution, hate speech is protected. And we also know that it has absolutely no place in it, San Francisco or in our communities. And so we must do whatever we can, not only after the fact, not only in a way that is reactive, to harm that has been caused by a hate crime, but in a way that is proactive and preventative, that helps heal, that helps build bridges and bring communities together. Thank you. Kesa, you promised to hold police officers accountable for misconduct and abuse and unjustified violence. And indeed, you brought the first homicide charges against officers in San Francisco history. And our own prosecuting attorney recently did the same here. But not surprisingly, this um, engenders some pushback um, and some concern as voiced by police and, and in many instances, police unions, for example. Can you share your experiences and thoughts on that? And uh, what can you do to improve this as a tool uh, for enhanced and better policing? I campaigned, as you said, on a commitment to enforce the law equally, to ensure that in our justice system, the quality of justice doesn't depend on the color of your skin or that it's not only just for the wealthy and well-connected. And part of that means holding those in power accountable when they commit crimes. Police officers, we know, we know from what happened with George Floyd and from the fact that it took a national movement, unprecedented national movement to force local prosecutors to even file those charges. Right? We know that there are tremendous obstacles to police accountability. We know that they are structural, that they are legal. And we know that police across this country and right here in San Francisco have developed a system of impunity where they can commit crimes, including murder, without consequence. And I campaigned to end that system of impunity. And I'm proud that the team 
that I've built to hold police accountable to investigate police use of force cases has filed now five separate cases, including the first and second ever homicide charges against an on-duty San Francisco Police Department officer for shooting and killing an unarmed black man while on duty. Those cases, as you say, have engendered tremendous political backlash. I am now facing not one, but a second recall attempt before I am even halfway through my first term. This recall effort has spent more than $1.4 million, more than any other sitting district attorney has ever faced to try to oust them while in the middle of a term, just spent on gathering signatures, flying people from around the country to San Francisco and paying them per signature that they collect in order to force a special election. In other words, the reaction to the work that I'm doing to the work that I'm doing to follow through on campaign promises I made transparently and explicitly to the voters of San Francisco. Work that was demanded, not just in San Francisco, but around the country by the Black Lives Matter movement last year. That work has engendered a fierce and well-financed backlash that is trying to undermine the work we're doing and the movement that we're part of. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Mesa, because I think a post in the immediacy of the George Floyd murder, right, there were, there was, support, greater support for the Black Lives Matter movement. And we've seen over the months that the data has borne out and surveys, et cetera, that that movement support has dissipated somewhat, right? And then on top of that, you know, do you worry that any rise in crime will be used further to dissipate the efforts you're making? Like how does the the, the rise in, in violent crime, for example, um, and drug overdoses, for example, I mean, how does that impact what you're trying to achieve? Well, I want to be clear about a couple of things. First of all, any violent crime is a problem for us, and we have to do more faster to prevent it and to hold those who commit it accountable. Any drug overdose that can be prevented through a safe consumption site or through harm reduction or medical intervention and treatment, we need to intervene. We need to save those lives. Second, in San Francisco, crime has gone down substantially since I took office. In my first year, overall crime was down by about 20%. Now, I know that statistic doesn't mean anything to someone who themselves was a victim of crime. It doesn't mean anything to someone who themselves feels less safe today than they did yesterday. And so my work is never done. As long as there is crime, as long as there are people who live in fear, I have work to do. It's also important to remember and to recognize that police unions, Republican operatives and the folks driving these recall efforts, not just in San Francisco, but for Governor Newsom, for other elected district attorneys around the state of California and beyond, the folks driving these efforts are expert at exploiting tragedies to undermine justice reform, to promote fear, and to push back on policies aimed at achieving racial justice. We cannot allow our criminal justice policies to be defined or determined by outlier tragedies that occur in every single jurisdiction. We must instead be driven by science, by data, by empirical evidence, and by racial equity. Thank you. And in the midst of all of this, as we sort of round out our conversation, um, you know, San Francisco and Honolulu both have really high priced housing markets and police officers inevitably end up doing, as you've mentioned, a lot of you know, non-policing work, whether that's in the social work sphere or the public health sphere, or the mental health sphere. And so jails become expensive shelters for the houseless in some ways. Um, and we've taken a number of approaches here, but I wanna hear what you think works best in combating some of these, you know, at the forefront where police are basically triaging social challenge. How do we go forward? For far too long, police have been forced to serve as a first line of response to mental health crises and drug overdoses. For far too long, jails and prosecutors have been a dumping ground for the unhoused and the impoverished and the unwell. It is ineffective, it is expensive, and it is inhumane. We need to free up police resources to focus on violent crimes in progress. And that means having social workers and medical practitioners serve in the role that they're uniquely positioned to serve in as a response to a public health crisis on our streets. Eugene, Oregon and the CAHOOTS program is a model for how we can do this work. And in San Francisco, I am proud to say that we are now beginning to implement a similar model, a street crisis intervention team that can respond to the public health crisis, 
and the public health emergencies that doesn't require police to distract themselves or to risk situations escalating into violence. Similarly, prosecutors have no role in jailing the unhoused simply because of their poverty. We need to make sure that every arrest is an opportunity for intervention and transforming lives away from crime. We need to make sure that in San Francisco and across this country, it is easier to get help than it is to get high on our streets. And we have a long way to go to achieve that reality. Thank you very much, Chesa. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. We appreciate it. We wish Thank you, you all so best. much. Take care. Thank you. Now I want to return from the Bay Area to Honolulu, to Oahu, to Hawaii, where we have a new prosecutor in town, uh, Mr. Steve Alm. Steve is an alumnus of the UH Lab School, and not long after finishing law school, he started his career in the Honolulu Prosecutor's Office. He went on to serve as U.S. Attorney for Hawaii and then had a long career as a circuit court judge where he started the famous HOPE probation program. In 2020, with the DA's office under federal investigation related to the Kealaha scandal, um, Steve Om announced he was running for the Office of Prosecuting Attorney. And he overcame and charted a course to win. And he's now been in that role since around last January, since last January, the, you know, it's almost a year now, Steve. And so welcome. I look forward to speaking with you, Prosecutor Om. Thank you. Good to be here. Nice to see you again, Camille. It's nice to see you too. Um, you had a long and successful career as a judge, Steve, and serving as prosecuting attorney, especially in these times, in the middle of a federal probe and during a pandemic is a Herculean task. So why were you called to serve in this way and, and what do you hope to accomplish? Well, I started in this office, as you say, way back when, like in 1985. And honestly, back then the, the ethos was you sent as many people to prison for as long as possible. It was a pretty narrow view, but I think a pretty typical one around the country. Uh, but even then, when I was a supervisor, I really tried to focus on doing justice, not winning cases. And Berger versus United States is a great uh, calling card for prosecutors that your job is doing justice and strike hard blows, but not foul ones. Be fair in what you're doing. And it was the investigations you talked about and the problems in the office that left me alternatively mad, sad, angry, that caused me to run to go back. Because as a judge, I, I'd encourage my law clerks, if they wanted to do litigation, go to the public defenders or go to the prosecutor's office. You're going to learn things the best. But for the last several years, none of them wanted to go to the prosecutor's office. So I knew we had to make it a place that was fair, that we uh, trained the deputies to be skilled, that we talked about doing justice and not winning cases. And we made it a place that people wanted to come work like your students at Richardson. And that's what I've been focusing on in large part for this year. Yeah, and you know, we, we as a matter of course, sort of like first principles in law school, first year crim law, we talk about that role of prosecuting attorneys and DAs in serving the ends of justice, not like just a tally sheet on a, a you know, a win loss column, but yeah. often that ethos is, it seems to have been lost along the way. But in the midst of it all, like Chesa, you brought historically unprecedented homicide charges against police officers recently, but also like Chesa, you know, you faced some opposition and pushback. So, you know, how have you been managing all that and, and, and how do you plan on going forward um, perhaps differently than your predecessors? Well, uh, when I was the United States attorney, we prosecuted Honolulu police officers for civil rights violations. They went to federal prison and I told the police union I'd be doing the same thing. Now, I had relationships with them going back to when I was a prosecutor here that was very helpful. And uh, I did that when I was here because we realized that the Honolulu Police Department, might, like many police departments, were investigating shootings involving their own personnel. And no matter what, even though they've got good investigators, you know, maybe they're coming up with good outcomes, a lot of people are going to question it. It's like if an investigator in our office was involved in a shooting, uh, we wouldn't investigate it. We'd have the police investigate it. And then if prosecution was needed, had the state attorney general's office do it. So it's really a, a feeling that nobody is above the law. Nobody gets a pass. My predecessor here, you know, got a target letter 
So we all in the system knows what know what that means and what might be likely happen in the future. Nobody gets a pass. And when, uh, when I go to the police academy with every recruit class, I talk about that. If they see a deputy prosecutor committing a crime, I expect them to investigate and follow through with it. Not Nobody gets a pass. Now, there is a small group that I think that believe police officers, because it's a tough, dangerous job, should never be held accountable. And I just disagree with that. Those days are over. Nobody is above the law. And I'll just deal with whatever pushback comes back. I'm in the perfect position for this. I'm not looking for another job. You know, I'm here to do justice. I'm not here to make friends. I'm not here to please people. I'm just going to do a thorough job, work with our good deputies here to make the good calls on all of the cases in front of us. And, and as you make those good calls and you're you're dealing with the serving up of justice in the ways that you think best and the perception of justice in the ways that you are articulating, right? Who, who gets to investigate whom, you know, how do you innovate in that space? And, and I know you're an innovative prosecutor. So, so what are, what are you most proud of? But I want to start with a shifting so you can actually shift the culture to be one of innovation. And then what are you, what are you doing in that space? Well, and part of it, you know, is really falling back on my years as a judge, because I, you know, what I'm trying to get across to our deputies is for the folks that are really violent and dangerous, the ones who absolutely won't stop stealing, they need to be locked up for a while. But when they're in prison, they should have programs, they should have rehabilitation. We should bring all, all of our prisoners home from Arizona. It's cheaper to house them there in a the short term, but in a long term, they've got to be here and they should get that kind of rehabilitation practice. But that is probably, you know, a third of the people at sentencing. That means the majority, vast majority, can and should be placed on probation. And we should use strategies. And I share with Chesa data, research, that should be driving criminal justice policy, not anecdote, not gut feelings, not we've always done it this way. And so uh, we want deputies to put people on probation. We want them to agree to probation, because I can tell you in the past as a judge, the deputies who tell me, oh, this guy needs probation, but you know my office, I have to ask for prison. Those days are over. I talked to them about that on the first day. I have to keep repeating it because it is something new. But I'll say, if this guy is deserving of probation, ask for probation. A deferral is fine. They can keep their record clean. And if they don't have a violent history, and even if they have a bunch of priors, probation may be appropriate. And if, and if you make the right call then, and the guy goes out there and commits a horrendous crime, I will have your back. I will be the one telling the press, no, this was done in my direction. It was the right call to make. We have to look at risk. We have to look at who's really dangerous uh, and make the right call that way. And we're doing that in, in whatever we're trying to do in the office, including in the weed and seed program. And I want to talk about that with you, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I want to hear about that. I want to ask the question around the data, which is, you know, beyond the sort of criminal convictions and the record keeping around records, do you feel you have the data around the diversion programs that can inform the type of decisions that you need to make? Well, we had great data when I was on the bench with Paul Perone and Lydia Fuataavi, who was just hired here as a deputy prosecutor, I'm happy to say. Uh, a UH Richardson grad, uh, we have great data like for hope probation. And with hope probation, it's a new way of supervising people uh, on probation, being supportive, but having swift and certain consequences that are very short typically. Uh, we have data, and what you're doing is you're trying to reform the probation system because we have about four times as many people on felony probation statewide as we do in prison. So if we want to reduce the number of people going to prison, which we certainly do, we need to use strategies like hope probation that have been shown. And we have data from uh, Pepperdine and UCLA showing the people in hope compared to probation as usual, got arrested for new crimes 55% less often, and they failed and went to prison half as often. So when you think about that, People got victimized less often. The police didn't have to investigate those cases and not going to prison. They went to prison 52% less often. And because unlike drug court, and which I'm a big fan of, or veterans court, 
the, a lot of specialty courts are really small. In Hope Probation, when I was uh, leaving the bench, I supervised more than 2,000 felony offenders in Hope, and they were going to prison half as often. That included hundreds of Native Hawaiians. And reducing poverty is a tricky thing from this perch at the prosecutor's office. But I, I can tell you, a, a mom or dad going to prison will drive a family into, into poverty faster than anything. So we have hundreds of Native Hawaiians who, who succeeded at probation because they were in hope and not in probation as usual. And I get stopped constantly on the street by people saying, thank you, Judge Alms, you know, local star, you had an S here. Th you know, you helped save my life. I said, you saved your own life. We helped you with it, but congratulations to you. And, and how do you connect that to any role you might see your office having in the reduction of racial disparities, right? We know the numbers in terms of over-incarceration yeah. and, racial, and racial disparities against Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in the criminal legal system. What's the role that your office can play in, in combating this over-incarceration? Okay, well, lots, lots of different things. One is making sure everybody here goes by that ethos. And we've already done, we'll continue to do implicit bias training, uh, but we will support things like hope probation where native Hawaiians on regular probation do so much worse than other ethnic groups, but in hope they do just about as well as the other ethnic groups. So things like hope probation, we did a pilot for hope pretrial by Steve Raphael from Berkeley did the randomized control trial study and compared to pretrial as usual, the people in hope were getting arrested for new crimes. 40% less often than the control group in pretrial as usual. They tested positive for drugs 20 to 30%. But part of that is because in the pilot, we had money for treatment pretrial. And so uh, we will be pushing that kind of things. Anything that's going to help people succeed on probation and try to expand that as time goes on to pretrial and to parole. Mm -hmm. Because many more people, they go to prison failing at all of those steps. And if we can help them succeed, they're better off, we're better off. And I talk to the prosecutors about if somebody succeeds on probation, we all win. Right. You know, they, they, their family wins, they're more likely to get a better job. I'm a big believer in deferrals, people can keep their records clean. Uh, and then we don't have to prosecute them again. You know, maybe they're taxpayers, or maybe, you know, some folks are really, you know, have had real challenges over life, they might need public assistance, but if they're not committing crimes and they're not using drugs the same way, they're gonna have ha happier and healthier lives. And how does your weed and seed program fit into this conversation around racial disparities in the criminal legal system and mass incarceration, right? How do you connect the dots and try to do what your, your, where your efforts are taking you? Okay, well, in weed and seed, the idea is you go into a community and you ask them, what, what are your crime issues? What are your social service gaps? What, what needs to help? And we had tremendous success the last time with 70% reduction in a high crime Chinatown downtown area and Mayor Wright homes in a community nearby. But we also listened to the community and started a Head Start program, started after school tutoring paid for by Lilio Kalani Trust at Kaiolani Elementary School, an after school sports program, because we know a lot of kids in, in that area at the time, full of Native Hawaiians, uh, Samoans. Now there's a much bigger Micronesian population there. But kids, if you don't give them something to do after school, are going to get in trouble. And we have to give them alternatives. And so part of that is going into the community. Because of COVID, I couldn't have Stu and Rice at Kayolani Elementary School to ask the community. So the four major banks downtown, uh, American Savings Bank, Central Pacific Bank, uh, First Hawaiian, and Bank of Hawaii, uh, they all donated together $110,000 because they believed in weed and seed and they wanted to help us because I told them part of the strategy is asking the community, what are the needs and how we can help? And one of the most exciting parts to it is uh, we have, we, we've been, this is a months long process, but it's just starting now. If, if a there are a lot of good homeless uh, approaches in town. CORE is a new program similar to, uh, to the program that, that, uh, that Chesa was talking about. Uh, the city is starting that ambulance type things with EMTs and social workers being able to help the, help the homeless when they address them and keep on with them. If regularly an EMT or police officer 
picks them up, even their hurt, takes them to emergency room, they then leave. Core will stay there and develop those relationships. And so there's a lot of good stuff going on. We're working with Connie Mitchell from Institute for Human Services on the ACT program. We're trying to start a diversion program uh, the judiciary asked us to participate in for people with mental health issues. But the new thing we're starting is if, if say a homeless person lying on the street in Chinatown gets arrested for drug possession, goes to OCCC, our jail. Immediately, they're being screened by intake service center. Then the Department of Health is doing assessments. And then they will place them in one of our many drug, drug or, and alcohol or mental health programs. All of that will happen quickly. And we can help folks because housing is great. It's important. But I think unless you deal with the behavioral health issues and you help people who have mental health issues or drug and alcohol issues, they're not going to succeed in housing. So what we're, I'm all about getting rid of silos, working together, uh, and this will be a part of it. So they go to residential treatment and then they, as, as they step down, hopefully we'll be able to get them into long-term housing, but in a position now where they can succeed. Right. So as a, as a last question, I mean, there's a there's an intersection here with socioeconomic status and the ability to deal with emergencies as they hit us. Right. And yeah. and we know from the asset limited and con constrained report. Right. Alice, that 20 percent of people in in this state, 20 percent of Hawaiian households don't have enough money uh, in savings to cover emergencies, including, for example, if bail is, is a, as a necessity. And we know that on the campaign trail, you pointed out that, you know, the current cash bail system really does penalize the poor and rewards those with more assets, as Chesa was saying. But is the system still here? Right? I mean, and what, how, what are you, how are you taking that on? It is still here. For, for one thing, with the, uh, it, as an example, we're using the Weed and Seed site as a pilot project for a lot of things. It's, mm -hmm. it's a smaller area. It's not tiny, but it's finite. And so even for these cases that we've just referred to, homeless people getting assessed, the intake service center is recommending against release for all of them, uh, the first group that came through. Well, I had a meeting with our deputies two days ago to say, we're going to recommend against release on one because there may be a potential robbery in the first degree case with a knife held to somebody's throat. But in the other four, they had it, many of them had extensive histories, but they were misdemeanors or there was a, a big drug sale, but it was 17 years ago. We're, we want those guys out. So we're going to, you know, make recommendations. Uh, our, our jail here uses the ORAS, the Ohio Risk Assessment. Uh, survey, uh, but it looks at likelihood of showing up at trial. I am more interested in risk for committing a new crime or a more violent crime. And so this is talking to our deputies. And I said, normally in the past, you would have objected to the release of these folks. I don't want you to do that. I want you to agree to the release of these folks because we are better off having them go to treatment and helping themselves rather than two, doing two or three years in Halaba prison coming out with worse issues they have then than they do now. So I think sure. the, I'm supportive of getting rid of cash bail. We need to have a system in place uh, to really replace it. And we will be supportive partners in making that happen. But it will be a sea change. And it's going to take some money from the legislature to increase the funding and services at the intake service center to supervise. Because as was said with cash bail, Somebody could be a very violent, dangerous person, terrible drug problem. If they can make the bail, they're out and they're not supervised at all. So if we can help them su to supervise better and give them treatment pretrial, I think we'll all be better off. Thank you so much, Prosecutor Om. Um, we really appreciate your time. We know you're super busy. It's always nice speaking with you. Great to talk to you, Camille. Take care. Our final guest works on the other side of the courtroom from prosecutors. Minda Yamaga is a federal public defender and she has served as Hawaii's deputy public defender from 2010 through 2015. She is also a Richardson alumna. So it's particularly nice to speak with you and thank you for joining us today, Minda. Thank you so much, Dean Nelson. And I feel so honored to follow um, the prior two guests. I mean, both are very well versed public speakers, successful politicians and leaders 
in their office, none of which I am. So I hope to bring a different perspective. You absolutely are. You absolutely <laughs> are. And we want to hear your perspective. Absolutely. It's, and it's, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for attorneys to work a few years as a public defender and then, then go into more lucrative private practice, but you know, you've stayed and you've been leading, you've stayed and you've been leading the way. So, you know, what compels you to stay? And, and to add to that, I have no intention at any point <laughs> um, in the near future to leave my work as a public defender. So I'll just do a, a quick little background, I guess. You know, so growing up, I was raised by scientists, professors at the University of Hawaii. I knew no lawyers. I, I was, I didn't even know what a public defender was as a kid. Um, I went to law school kind of on a, a lark. I was a little bit older. Um, I had two young children and was trying to figure out uh, a job, basically. And while in law school, I was um, inspired by some amazing professors. I know Professor Levinson was one of those individuals. Also, I, I very much enjoyed the, um, the clinic courses, the practicum courses, and, and learned what a public defender was and, and decided that is what I wanted to do. And so I, I stick with it because I feel um, fortunate to have kind of decided on a career and then been able to go ahead and, and get it. You know, if you're thinking of like, a scale of one to 10, where one is I'm here for the paycheck and 10 is I'm a professional athlete doing my true passion. I think I'm on the higher end of that scale. And I feel like that's a very fortunate thing. Um, obviously, not all of the things that I'd like to uh, achieve can be done from within the courtroom or within the system. And that's why I certainly am very honored to, to be in this conversation, which is something outside of my work, where maybe some of the other changes and, and I can make some of the impact that I'd like to, that I'm not able to do inside the courtroom. That's great. And it's great that you're, you're contented and in a happy place, not part of this great resignation, right? But um, the, the, your office has a really good reputation nationally. Um, and so you're, you're doing great work. But do you feel though that you have the resources that you need to, to, you know, um, to enhance the work that needs to be done? especially relative to what the prosecutor's office has in terms of resourcing? So I'm unfortunate. I'm a little over a decade into my career. I've spent about half the time as a state uh, deputy state public defender, half the time here as a federal public defender. So I have the perspective of both what the state resources are and what the federal resources are. I'm going to focus this conversation or this answer more to my experiences as a state public defender. Um, I think that there is a, a distinct disparity in the resources between the offices. Um, obviously, when you're thinking about um, things such as, I understand it's comparing apples and oranges. I don't want to simplify the answer. I know that the duties of each role um, of each office are different, but you know, there's some comparisons you can make. Salaries, resources for investigators and or experts. Um, and when you look at the prosecutor's office, when they need an expert, it's often a government employee. We have medical examiners, HPD chemists, police officers, police officer investigators, forensics, ballistic experts. Those do not come out of the prosecutor's budget. When a public defender needs an investigator or an expert, that's going to be directly pulled um, from their budget. And so I am concerned about this disparity. I think that it should, we all want, I mean, every single one of us that has spoken today, um, I believe all the attendees and the public want justice, want a better and safer community. That is why we are all working at what we're doing. And so what we do want is exactly justice to be reached in these cases, and that often requires resources. Um, as a federal public defender, we do have really, um, we have good access to resources. So I can you know, just briefly talk about a, a situation where I had a client who it was a quite unusual case just recently. I have this client who um, we were able to retain experts that were able to do psychological evaluations, neurological evaluations, and explain both to me as his attorney, but also the prosecutor and the judge what was going on. It was complicated because he had this uh, a brain injury that was caused not through his own fault, but by a freak accident that specifically impacted certain portions of his brain, but not others. And, and to be honest, it was such an unusual situation. It took me understanding through the lens of an expert to, to be able to adequately advocate for my client. And it was with those 
we spent a decent amount of money and time. That's the other thing I have as a federal public defender is a decent amount of time. I was able to explain to the prosecutor and to the judge ultimately and receive a very unusual outcome for a case that otherwise would have resulted in a very lengthy jail sentence. And it's just, it's, so it's not always looking at experts for trial for winning a case, but it's really often you need these resources, time and money to seek justice in cases. And so I am concerned. Precious, time is a precious resource, isn't it? Yes, I'm concerned about the parity um, and the disparity. The, the lack of parity between the office and the state public defenders and the prosecutors. And I want to give you the chance to weigh in on this conversation that we've been having around cash bail. And I'd appreciate your thoughts on, on what might be done and what should we to should, what ought to be done. Thank you. And I do think cash bail is one of these kind of low hanging fruit of policy issues that we can address. I mean, if you came up to somebody that knew nothing about the American criminal legal system and explained, oh, just as Chesa did earlier, oh no, it's fine. As long as you're rich, you can get out of jail regardless of the crime that you committed. I, I don't think there is anybody in the public or any other kind of, you know, anybody that you've explained that to that would say, that's a great system, let's all be behind it. And I think Judge Alm said the same. This is, he understands that letting dangerous people out of jail just because they have money is not something that we can justify in our criminal legal system. I also know that Judge Alm was at the federal, on the federal side as I am now, where we have an extremely robust and successful pretrial system. Um, we release on the federal side, especially in the District of Hawaii, a vast majority of the individuals that are charged with crimes, and these are federal crimes, so you know they're very serious crimes. And we are able to release them into a robust pretrial service. Um, the pretrial services, as Judge Om talked about, is able to provide housing, mental health treatment, drug treatment, counseling, family support, um, I, I also now know there are quite a few large corporations that tend to hire our clients that are on federal pretrial release. So a lot of my clients get jobs and are really starting to mend the process, the, mend the harm that they have caused through drug use or crimes or other things of that nature. And that, of course, is what every single one of us wants for our community. We want these harms to be mended. Victims want harms to be mended. The children of my clients want these harms to be mended so that they are not telling their story in 20 years to their public defenders, right? And so I know that um, Judge Alm is very well-versed in this system, and I understand that his concern, I think, is that the robust system is not yet in place in our state, um, in our state courts, right, as it is in our in our federal system, and I don't want to pretend that I understand how to scale up, because that is also a difficult issue. But I think it's exactly as he has done today, and even on a larger setting, advocating that that is the right thing to do. Speaking to the public, we talked a lot about culture and public and getting the will of the legislatures, which of course correlates to the public behind these issues. And so it's gonna take leaders such as Judge Alm and others in our community really talking it up about how important it is and reiterating at every chance they can, not just on forums like this, but in newspapers and other bigger, bigger platforms also. Thank you. And let me ask you one last question. Sure. So, you know, some scholars have commented and noted that in some ways, public um, defenders perform a de facto social worker function and that you develop insights into why people commit crimes. And so having worked in our community for some time, what have you observed about the rationale or some of the reasons people commit crimes and how might that inform our national leadership in the prosecutors and DA's office going forward? Yes, um, especially as a federal public defender because so much of my work is geared towards sentencing, mitigation and storytelling. I really get to know um, my clients' backgrounds. I mean, we start at the beginning. We start at their, their childhoods and we talk about it. And without a doubt, especially my female clients, but, but almost all my clients have been victims of crimes themselves, whether or not those crimes were prosecuted. I don't, you know, not always, but, you know, my, I, I, I cannot remember, I, it is rare that I have uh, a female client who has not been abused and 
a variety of ways as a child. It is rare that I have any client whose father or mother have not also been addicted to drugs or ripped apart, ripped away from them when they were children. I mean, so it is really what we are doing in our current carceral system is really creating future criminals. And everybody knows that is exactly the opposite of what we want to do. And um, I, I've been doing this for over a decade and I've had lots of clients go to into custody for a long time and in telling their personal stories and talking about the harms and feeling the the pain that they've gone through, I, I, it never, I never cease to A, be so thankful for the life I have and B, feel, try to feel what they've experienced and understand that this just isn't about feeling for this person, that's my client, which I always do, but it's about the future, right? It's about making a safer future. It's about having their children grow up in an environment that does not create future criminals. Thank you for joining us today, Minda, and thank you for all of your hard work and dedication and for your empathy. We appreciate it. Mahalo to all of our guests for joining us today and for this important conversation. I'd like to thank all of the sponsors of today's event, the UH Better Tomorrow Speaker Series and its partners, the Hawaii Community Foundation and Kamehameha Schools. The William S. Richardson School of Law, which is also a series sponsor, and the King Kamehameha the Fifth Judiciary History Center, which all helped out in putting this program together. Please do stay tuned for future conversations, including topics on racism and criminal justice, climate policy, housing, and artificial intelligence. Please also subscribe to the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series on our website or on social media to receive updates. Mahalo to all of you for joining us today.